it took. Who was your main sounding board when you were going through that process, uh, that very political process? Let's see. Well, for sure I talked to my partners a lot um, because they were directly affected. You know, when you're a nominee for that long, it does affect um, your ability to get clients. Um, some clients, understandably, will say, why should I hire you? You might not be here to do the trial or to finish the appeal. Um, I was lucky that I was in a firm large enough that some of my partners could funnel work to me. And in fact, I did do that um, trademark case while I was a nominee. Um, so I would say my partners were. Definitely, I was in close touch with the staff at Senator Inouye's office. And at that time, the office that was called the Office of Policy Development, it's changed its name since, um, in the Department of Justice, um, had people who helped me a great deal. And we joked about it because I was assigned to a, a woman named Kathy Poston. Kathy Poston had two children born to her while awaiting my confirmation. <laughs> and then there was an attorney in Senator Inouye's office, and I was joking to him about Kathy Poston's babies. And I said, you know, if you want to have a child, just stick around because somehow I, you know, people get pregnant while waiting for me to be confirmed. And his name was Mark Fox, and he told me that he had not yet told his boss, but that he and his wife had learned that she was pregnant, and maybe the baby would be born before I was confirmed. So <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I was a pregnancy, you know, uh, people were teasing me. I was a fertility <laughs> goddess during that time. So tell us a little bit about some of the pro bono work that you did while you were in private practice. Um, I remember that one of the things I did was um, I represented a group of Filipino men who had had actually decades of litigation about some land. Um, they had a small religious group and they didn't have any money but they, they practiced their religion on this land and so we filed um, a lawsuit and there had actually been prior litigation by them that had gone up to the Hawaii Supreme Court. I left before it was concluded because it took so long again and I left it to one of my partners. But that was actually a very rewarding experience. Um, you know, I, I dealt with the, the el they were very elderly and they had their children come in and talk to us about their parents. So it was a very personal kind of experience, very rewarding for me. You've also served on the boards of a number of, of organizations. Yes. How, how did that come to be? Well, um, so Hawaii Women Lawyers, and, and there's an adjunct Hawaii Women Lawyers Foundation. I have served on those boards, and that is, um, it's fun to have seen that organization grow. It was, it existed, but was still fairly young when I first um, joined those as a member, and then I became an officer, and those organizations have grown um, a lot um, in the years that I've been involved with them. So that's actually very nice to see. And um, I've been involved with the American Judicature Society, um, which is an exciting group. Hawaii's chapter is very active. And um, we have a former national president of the American Judicature Society, who is an attorney in Honolulu. And he's very aggressive in doing studies and setting up committees and getting us to write reports. We all actually tell him, we try to hide from him, not answer his phone calls. It always means work for us. But it's, it's actually very exciting to be involved with that group. Since you've been on the bench, you've handled a number of pretty interesting cases. Are there any that you'd like to specifically talk about right now? Uh, <clears throat> well, I just finished one um, that involved espionage charges. It went on for about four months. And um, because there was so much classified information, just administering the case is very complex when you have to deal with, you know, being careful um, what gets discussed in which, you know, cleansed room and, and handling the documents. Um, you know, when you have those long trials, um, you know, of course I want to handle them as efficiently and fairly as possible, but once the jury is out, my main interest is in getting a verdict, no matter what it may be, because the worst thing is when the jury is hung and you have to retry one of those. Um, so um, luckily we got a verdict in that case. Today, while we've been at this conference, 
I had a, a different jury out and that jury was hung on one party. It did reach a verdict on another party. So I may have to try that case, but it wasn't four months, so it's not as horrible. And do you have a technique to try to keep the juries from uh, making a decision? Oh, to try to get them to, to return? try to get them well, to that, that's on a case by case basis, and of course, that kind of thing is hotly debated by the attorneys. Um, and this time, that actually, the jurors this time were very uh, forthright about telling us that don't ask us to deliberate more because they had been deliberating quite a long time. But it's not too terrible if it's a short trial. And it's Hawaii. And it is Hawaii, yes, yes. <laughs> but you know, happy. Hawaii, because it, it, if you think about the geography, we draw our jurors from all islands. And so on almost every jury, even though the trial occurs in Honolulu, you are going to have neighbor island jurors. And that creates its own complication too because they fly in. And so that, that is, the, just the transportation within our district is, an, is a special issue that the judge always has to be conscious of. Right, and maybe that makes it easier to sequester juries? We, I have not yet had that, um, the sequestering. Um, and we actually offer our jurors the chance to come in every morning and fly home every night, since it's not a long uh, flight. But many of them prefer just to stay in Honolulu during the week because otherwise they have to get up so early in the morning. But we leave that up to them. We will pay either for their day-by-day um, -day flights or for their hotel. Okay. The, the case you mentioned a moment ago, the espionage case, yes. where, you, where you did get the, the verdict. Right. That, I believe that was reported fairly Just routine. recently, yes. Yes, yes. and he, he lived on Maui. So I'm sure on Maui it was big news too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, the spies are so much in the news these days. It's, it's an, it was an interesting case. Yeah. Well, it sounds like it. Are there any other cases that stand out? Yes, I had um, a slavery case. For some reason, um, it's the luck of the draw, I think. I have had more than the normal judge's share of cases involving involuntary servitude. And, um, and a couple of them have gone to trial. And the longest one went to another four-month trial, and it involved a um, gentleman from Korea who lived in American Samoa and was charged with having brought in garment factory workers from Vietnam and from China. The reason the trial took so long was there was very little testimony in English. We had Korean, Samoan, um, Vietnamese, and Chinese. And uh, many times the Vietnamese dialects were very difficult for the um, urban translators to translate. And so it, it created confusion many times. They would translate one way and then they would realize they had misunderstood. That we'd have to backtrack as they corrected themselves. Um, the, the, the humorous part I remember even in a serious trial, as you heard Judge Brinkema say about the Musawi trial, they're often funny things. There was an incident where um, there was a translation, but it was a translation of expletives. And there was, um, there, the circumstances caused an attorney to question whether the expletives had been correctly translated. So uh, this was a layer upon layer of translation. And um, eventually we figured out what the appropriate translation should have been, which was something I won't repeat here. And to their glee, the attorneys insisted all that this correction had to be pronounced by me, which of course I knew was just a, a lovely ploy on their part so they could go back to their offices and laugh about how the judge said these horrible things, but I did it. <laughs> but but I, that, that was a memorable part of that trial. Yeah, well, the good news is the press couldn't publish that. So <laughs> I you, guess. You weren't going to be quoted they on that. They didn't quote me on that. <laughs> since, since being on the bench, we've talked about role models, but is, is there any judge on the federal bench here who particularly stands out currently as someone that you go to hmm. and talk to? I talk to all of them. I, 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 um, I'm lucky to have colleagues that are collegial and that I respect, so it's not unusual for me to use them as sounding boards on different issues. I feel really lucky that they're all very generous um, when I do that. So I, 
I, you know, I consult with all of them. That includes the magistrate judges who are all very experienced um, and they, they were litigators before and they have you know, lots of background to help me. So I, I, I would say I, I, I uh, use all the resources I have available and that's all my colleagues. It, it must be quite a change having been in civil practice. The cases that yes. you've mentioned as most memorable were both criminal cases. Yes. That, that's quite a switch from what you were handling before. Um, I only mentioned those because they were such lengthy trials. Um, that's also a switch from civil practice. The trials tend not to be right and not to go, not to go, uh, not to often. go at all. Yeah, right. Um, you know, when I got on the bench, I was really conscious that I was um, totally ignorant in criminal law because my practice had been entirely civil. And you know, I, I knew that when I was a civil litigator and I appeared before a judge, if I knew that the judge's background was entirely criminal, um, you know, I, that, that was not my preference. And so I imagined that the um, criminal uh, practice lawyers who appeared before me um, would also have preferred someone with criminal law background, not just me, the commercial litigator. And, um, you know, I committed to trying to learn this and I actually um, did not involve my law clerks in my criminal calendar as much as in my civil calendar because I just wanted to, to learn it and to be so hands-on. And so, you know, different judges handle things different ways, but for me, my law clerks work primarily on my civil calendar and I, um, you know, really take the laboring oar in my criminal cases. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Well, it's gone by very, very quickly. I do have one wrap-up question. Is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you'd like to speak of before we turn off the video? No, I, I, I sure hope that our videographer, Chris, is making me look good. That's the only thing I can you say. Look terrific. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.